Welcome to the Midtown Comics Book Club. This month, our very special guest, Jim Salakrub. Give him a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, Jim, as you probably know, because it was the subject of this entire book club, was the editor for Craven's Last Hunt, the Spider-Man story that Demetrius has gone on record several times as saying was the greatest Spider-Man story ever written. For anybody that hasn't been here before, we're going to uh, discuss um, some details about the book and uh, Jim's work on it, and then we're going to open up to questions to you guys. So if you have questions, make sure to hold on to them and remember them, because you're going to get a chance to, to ask the man himself. Audience, hey, uh, raise your hands if you, if you got a chance to read the book. Whether you read it for, for okay, so I would say 98 percent. You have to leave. <laughs> okay, now uh, there's another question. Who read it for the very first time just for the book club? Okay. All right. Smaller percentage, but that just proves that we did our job in the book club because you guys just read an awesome Wait, story. Wait, who regrets it? We'll see if we can. Yeah, who regrets, who regrets it? it? No one. Okay, yeah, right. we knew that. <laughs> so. Um, Jim, I guess the first thing I want to just get a history of uh, you coming in with Marvel. So how did you get started being uh, editing at Marvel? Oh, a kid growing up in the Bronx and the projects. Uh, I loved comic books and TV and movies and pop culture in general. Uh, specifically loved comic books a, a lot and uh, would try to find out everything I possibly could about it. In those, this was in, in the early '60s. Mm -hmm. uh, no internet. I, I couldn't Google anything. It was all, uh, you know, precious few books about the comic book right, industry. Right. It was like Viper's book. Uh, I think in the late '60s, Serenko's history of comics. They were fanzines. I would try mm -hmm. to subscribe to as many as I could. And uh, somewhere along the line, I just decided. You know, this, I love this so much, I have to be a part of it. I want to be in comics. Uh, I think I was hoping to be a, maybe an artist or a writer. Uh, you'll find out whenever you talk to editors, they're usually uh, uh, frustrated writers <laughs> or artists. You know, but, uh, you know, so I, I was just desperate to, to become a part of that world, which right. when you're in the Bronx, the Manhattan is this Oz-like, fantasy land. So uh, I would just you know, send letters to the, to the comics. I got one printed in Daredevil number 77. Wow. So that was like, like this weird connection. Oh, it's possible. It's like stepping Your into another in dimension. I, 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 it, it happened. Do you have a copy of DD77? Uh, somewhere. <laughs> oh, I drew a little kick, a postcard with the Hulk on it. I sent it into Marvel. And I said, I'll be your slave. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever you want, you know. And they responded. <laughs> really? Like, we need more slaves. This was in uh, the summer of 1972. And Marvel was expanding at that point. Mm -hmm. Stan Lee had been promoted to the publisher. Roy Thomas was the editor in chief. And they were adding more and more titles every day. And as a result, Again, this was before the internet, before even Federal Express. All they had was this quaint organization, I think, that's teetering now, uh, the post office. <laughs> and they would actually mail the original artwork from Marvel to the Comics Code Authority, another Jeez. great thing that no longer <laughs> exists. And then the Comics Code Authority, if, there, if it was approved, yeah. would then send it on to this print in, printer in Sparta, Illinois, which is no longer there either. <laughs> and that's how comics were done pretty much See, up until... The Comic Code's authority sent it to the printer? Yeah, oh, or they'd send it back tomorrow. I don't know, I can't right. I think they may have sent it to wow. the printer. But uh, what was happening, by adding so many titles, they were increasing production, they were beginning to run behind schedule, and to save, cut some time out of the equation, they would, were hiring messengers. Well, to have this, instead of sending it special delivery, <laughs> you know, they have someone run it from, you know, I think Marvel was secretly at uh, 635 Madison Avenue. Okay. And bring it down to the Comics Code Authority, and they'd, they'd save a day or two. Right. And one of the guys who was like right, uh, Stan's 
Stanley's right hand production man in the 60s was a guy named Saul Brodsky. And uh, he was looking at the, uh, the invoices. He was in charge of like, running the office and all that, and noticing they were starting to pile up. I addressed my postcard to Roy Thomas, saying I'll be a slave. <laughs> and Roy had a fairly enlightened policy that instead of just hiring anyone you know, for any job, you know, even like uh, the job was technically a messenger job. Yeah. And the, I don't know if you, any of you are messengers or have been around do. messengers. Mm -hmm. A lot of them would just, you know, come in, where did you got to go? And, <laughs> and they'd, be, they'd probably be sitting there smoking all day, just waiting to deliver mm -hmm. the next package. Whereas Roy figured, hey, we're, we're so understaffed. If we get some kid who knows something about comics, we could keep them busy and making photocopies. What interns right, do right, in right. comics now? So I got this uh, uh, postcard, I think, from Mary Mack, saying, come down to our real address. Uh, I went down there, got a guided tour of the bullpen by John Romita Sr. Wow. Up until then, I, uh, my name at home was always Jimmy, my parents called mm -hmm. me that. In school I was always James. John Romita Sr. asked, uh, what's your name, kid? Uh, uh, James, sir. And he said, okay, Jim, this way. <laughs> and from then on I've been known as Jim Salakrup, thanks christened by John uh -huh. Romita Sr. Uh, <laughs> Saul Brodsky loved my, you know, I'll be a slave for free offer and wanted to take me yeah. up on it. Roy Thomas, thanks to him, he said, pay the kid. <laughs> so one of the great things that happened that's never happened to me since is like living in the Bronx and even getting, you know, the minimum wage back then. Mm -hmm. uh, working at Marvel, I, right away I was getting all my comics for free. That cut out one of my biggest expenses. <laughs> and. Uh, I actually, after a month or two, reached a, a moment in time that I don't think I'll ever reach again, where I, I got to the point where I, I thought, I can't think of anything else to buy. <laughs> I, I, I got everything I, I want. But then, years later, when I turned 18 and moved out on my own and had yeah, to pay for there everything, were more things to buy. And all that, that, yeah. that was the end of that. But, that was the short version yeah. <laughs> of how I wound up at Marvel. Once I got in, I was like a pit bull. Mm -hmm. I took a bite out of Marvel's leg, and they tried for 20 years to get rid of me, <laughs> and I, I just wouldn't let go until, you know, eventually I thought, okay, I've been here long enough. <laughs> how do you feel about when you hear stories uh, nowadays, uh, young kids that want to get into comics, they want to either in turn to become editors or writers or artists or anything like that. They have so many hoops and so many challenges. Yeah, that that postcard ahead thing of them. won't work for anyone else. Yeah, I mean that sure. just that would just it was like right, winning the, the lottery. Yeah. 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 Uh, well you never know. I mean uh, over the years uh, you know, I've hired lots of people, mm -hmm. other editors, I've, you know, everyone's getting a break somehow. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, obviously there's only <laughs> You know, so many companies, so many publishers, but at the same time, uh, there are probably far more opportunities now than back then as well. Right. I didn't have the option to post my own comics online and you know, or print them out as I could have printed. Them out. I could print them as uh, mini comics or something yeah, like yeah. that. But the kind of the distribution you could possibly get online, or there was no direct market. You mm -hmm. know, comic book stores were right. unheard of. So. Yeah. Uh, this this whole sense of community that exists today, the conventions every other you know week somewhere in, in the United States. So it, it, there are opportunities. It is frustrating, and I've seen people like this where they say, "I want to write X Men," <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's like, "Well, you're really narrowing." <laughs> you know, I, I just so read, won't be uh, that want to do that. <laughs> well, you know, like. Uh, Judge uh, Sonia Sotomayor, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, uh, um, Sotomayor uh, did a, a, a memoir recently, mm -hmm. and one of the you know she said I wanted it to be you know for children and, and inspire them, and, uh, and and she acknowledges in her introduction, uh, well you're on the Supreme Court, 
How many Supreme Court justices are there? I'll ask you. Twelve? Yeah. Is it a nine? Is it twelve? Nine. Uh, nine. Yeah. Fifty. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, like, it's great to inspire children, but there's only like nine openings, and <laughs> each one of them gets that job for life. Right, right. Wait, so, so how did Sotomayor get the position? Did she send uh, a postcard with the drive? The I will be. But she came from the Bronx, grew oh, up in the cool. projects, <laughs> read Nancy Drew, uh, which is published by Paper Cuts, had a graphic novel for him. But, you know, she was mainly interested in, you know, law and justice and all that, and never expected to be on the Supreme Court. But the point being is that, you know, there are only finite openings and very, you know, specific right. You know, the, the the more the better thing to do, in, in a sense, is also what I did. It's just like I was so general in saying I just want to be in comics. Yeah. You know, I didn't care what it was, <laughs> and 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 from being an intern, anyone who's lucky enough to become an intern, I learned so much through osmosis that when I was at the Marvel bullpen, I was around every day. There was Stan Lee and John Romita and Roy Thomas and Herb Trimpe and uh, Marie Severin, Frank Giacoya, yeah. Steve Gerber, George Russo's. I mean, to, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with those people, but to me they were like, uh, these were the gods of comics. And I was this, you know, this like little tiny human who was plucked up to, you know, walk around Asgard where your, your namesake hangs out. And uh, I, I was just there trying to learn as much as I possibly could. Uh, you know, and I did. I mean, when you'd hear them, you, you don't even realize it when it's happening. You're just there, you're watching how they handle things, how, right. they, how they get together, how writers would talk about ideas. And, and uh, now it's all these years later, and I'm a, an editor-in-chief at Paper Cuts, and I find myself uh, talking to new writers and artists, and a lot of times saying things, it'll suddenly hit me, oh, I remember Roy telling an artist, or Jerry Conway told us for that artist, and so to more specifically answer your question, yeah, sure, it's hard. I think any creative field you choose, I don't think there's any, you know, one that you could pick where you just show up Okay, uh, I, I got my guitar. Can I be a rock star now? Or, you know, it's like the, the competition is uh, yeah. near impossible. And sort of, you know, the the most insightful thing I ever read about it was uh, an actor uh, was interviewed once. I can't remember who it was, but the actor was you know pretty self-aware for an actor mm -hmm. and saying back in acting school. You know, he didn't think he was the most talented one in the class. Yet he was the one who later became a big movie star. Yeah. And he doesn't think it's because he was so great. He said he was the only one who didn't give up. So it's a, a, a lot to be said for persistence and just, if, if you really want to do it, it's no guarantee you'll succeed. But if you just keep at it and keep trying every possible thing, you can. And I think, you know, there are opportunities, you know, like you can, one way or another, even if you have to publish it yourself or put it online, yeah. and, you know, you know, use Facebook to tell every relative and friend you have, look at my comics, you know, you could do something. It's not, not impossible. But uh, yeah. you're saying that people from the Bronx have the odds stack in their favor. That's what I Well, that goes without saying. I, I believe uh, Stan, De Stan Lee denies he's from the Bronx. He grew up in uh, uh, Manhattan, but he did go to the Bronx Science High School. And, uh, people like Will Eisner and Jerry Robinson and Bob Kane, and I could go on. The Bronx has brought forth a tremendous amount of uh, you know, great people in the comic book world, and I think it's still done.